Welcome back to my Warhammer lore. Today I have a bit of a special video in that usually I kick off a new race that I am covering with the introduction of their gods and deities. But this faction does not actually have their own gods, uh, unless you count Nagash as a deity, which technically he is, but not quite until the end times, where he essentially becomes the Nehekarn god of death. And if you haven't guessed by now, I will be covering the vampire counts in the upcoming lore videos. But I also want to cover vampires in general. So this video is going to be a general introduction into vampires in Warhammer Fantasy. What a vampire is, who they are or can be, where you can find them, and a brief history of how they came to be as a faction, or a race in this case. I will be going into more detail with the specific bloodlines in the future videos, so some of these topics will be expanded upon, so forgive the lack of detail in certain aspects. With that being said, I am compiling all of the information for this video from the latest and older Vampire Count Army books, as the older editions I usually don't use with the, um, the current lore, but some of the older editions had the inclusion of the separate bloodlines of the different types of vampires, which I will be covering in more detail later, and of course I'm also going to be taking information from the Warhammer fantasy novels. Now, a good place to start this video will be with the vampire's origins. Now, I have covered this several times in my previous videos, specifically my legendary lore videos for the Tomb Kings, but I will rehash this lore again for anyone new to the channel, or if maybe you just need a refresher. Now, as far as a consistent lore of the origins of the vampires and Nagash in general, there's a lot of contradiction between the army books and the novels. You have to realize that Warhammer Fantasy is, or I should say was, about 30 years old when it was not too gloriously put to pasture, and in that time there were rewrites and additions to the lore, and so I tend to go with what I think makes a better story. Now I do have a preference for the novels mostly because I think the writers do a fantastic job of placing you in the Warhammer universe. So my timeline and history for my lore videos might differ from the army books, and that is especially true for the vampire accounts. The origins of the vampires can be traced back to ancient Nehakara, what is now the land of the dead ruled by the Tomb Kings. The vampires being a undead are spawns of the great necromancer Nagash. At the time of when this all takes place, Nagash was the head priest of the Mortuary Cult, established by the first great ruler of Khemri, Setra the Imperishable. The Mortuary Cult was charged with finding a cure for death so that the Great One might be resurrected and spend eternity ruling and conquering the Warhammer world in a youthful and rejuvenated body for all eternity. The Mortuary Cult, despite the death of Setra hundreds of years in the past, was still making strides towards this goal, and all of this discourse and techniques were passed down to the current generation, that being Nagash's generation. Since he was the latest and perhaps one of the most curious and ambitious of the Grand Hierophants in memory, his um, father was the reigning and the current king of kings in Nehekara, the ruler of Khemri itself. Because of this, Nagash was also privy to matters of state, and of course the outcome of the latest dissension in Nehekara. A rival city to Khemri challenged Nagash's father's rule, and the king personally took to the battlefield to support his troops. He was leading them to an assured victory, when all of a sudden the king was struck down by a black lightning bolt, and his army lost all morale, and the day was ultimately lost. Now Nagash, being the head of the mortuary cult, was in charge of preparing his father's body for internment, which included removing his organs and other various grisly acts when one is embalmed. However, when Nagash removed his father's armor, he found that his insides were molded into one fleshy shape and blackened as if a great fire had started inside his body. This would have repulsed a lesser man, but this piqued his curiosity more than anything as it was obvious to Nagash that some work of treachery had slain his father. Of course, he had never really liked his father, but Nagash desired power above all else, and so when the rival city came to make peace with his brother after the battle, 
they gave up three strange prisoners as slaves to be used as sacrifices for the ceremonies to inter the former king. They were in fact Druchi, or Dark Elves as we know them, whom had washed upon the shore after a great storm. Nagash knew immediately that they were responsible for the magic, and obviously their rivals did not want some curse to befall themselves for killing them. Now, if you are asking yourself at this point, how the heck does this relate to vampires, I am getting there. You see, Nagash, instead of having these dark elves sacrificed, he actually hid them away and forced them to teach him their magics. Vidruchi, of course, refused to teach him everything, but they were a little off-put by how quickly this man picked up on their teachings, and in fact, how he began to change and tailor their spells to fit with his understanding of anatomy and access to hundreds of years of miracles, or as they probably should be known, spells of the Nehekon Pantheon. Nagash took the dark magic he was being taught and refined it to his liking. He soon found that he could manipulate the individual winds, and through his knowledge of life and very much death, he figured out a way to take the life energy or soul of another and distill its essence to extend his own life. Through his dark magic, he managed to do what no other member of the mortuary cult could. He conquered death. Of course, it wasn't permanent and he would need more time to study and learn if he was to conquer it completely. This is where Ark in the Black and many others were drawn into Nagash's entourage with the promise of eternal life and inhuman strength above all other men. Nagash himself and his cronies became the first of what would be known as immortals. Now these should not be confused with vampires. Yet. The way in which Nagash harvested life's essence was through fear and suffering. A trick he learned from the Druchi, which somehow brought one's life essence when on the verge of death to the forefront and made it all the more potent for the elixir. At this point, Nagash managed through a technique passed down through Nehekara of drinking the blood of sacrifices to imbue gifts of the gods to distill this life essence into the blood of his victims and then after they were ceremonially drained into a large bowl, the elixir could be drank and the strength and vitality of the sacrifice would be transferred to the consumer, meaning that the young and strong willed sacrifices made for the best as it is often the case in many other um, cults and various religions in the Warhammer universe. This discovery led ultimately to Nagash gaining enough power both magically and politically that he successfully overthrew his brother and claimed the throne of Kimri, despite being a member of the mortuary cult or the priest class in the Hakarn society. Of course this didn't go over well with every city, and after a brutal reign that nearly bankrupt Nehekara, the various priest kings rallied together to overthrow the usurper Nagash. Nagash having killed, or for the most part upset, the majority of able-bodied men that he needed for his defense, instead came up with a new trick to turn the tides of battle, instead relying upon himself. Through the manipulations of the Wind of Death and Dark Magic, he found that he had no need for living servants when he could simply reanimate their corpses. As we all know, if you've seen my previous Tomb King videos, this did not go over well in the slightest. In fact, the desecration of the sacred dead was unheard of, and the birth of necromancy did in fact give Nagash a significant advantage over his foes, but it also rallied them to a single cause. As his troops needed no water or food, they were very effective, they never tired, and as long as they inflicted casualties amongst the enemy, they could easily be re replaced with those that they felled. It is truly a horrifying way of waging war. Now, however, Nagash was ultimately defeated and driven out of Nehekara, banished to a far off land, at least for a time. In his absence, his necromantic tomes and his chief lieutenant, Ark in the Black, were captured and spirited away to Lamia, where they would grace the courts of Lamaseptra and his queen, Neferata. You see, Lamaseptra during the Civil War saw the potential of the immortals and wished to actually become one himself. Of course, he did not know the particulars, but he was willing to sacrifice anything to obtain the power of the usurper himself. It was discovered during the war that not only did the immortals possess 
supernatural speed and strength, but they could not be killed easily. In fact, they survived wounds that no mortal man can boast, ranging from being shot with arrows and run through with spears to losing limbs. Of course, if they were decapitated, they would ultimately die, and if their bodies were burned, they didn't seem to be capable of being rehealed. Now, Arkin, having been laid low by a javelin through the heart, was incapacitated, but once it was removed, he began to regenerate. Of course, without the elixir of Nagash, it would be a slow process, but one that he could ultimately take. The King of Lamia used Arkin to translate and teach himself and a few of his court how to distill this elixir. Arkin, being a more cunning individual than Lama Sevtra would give him credit for, never completely taught them how to make the elixir in its entirety. And in fact, he was working on a way to escape through the private and forbidden tutelage of the Queen Neferada, whom in secret was visiting the immortal and progressing much farther in the ways of magic than this fool king. In fact, Arkin felt something of a kinship with this woman, and perhaps even something else. Maybe affection. A feeling that his blackened soul had not felt in decades. Through various treacheries and revelations, it was brought to the king's attention that his sister queen had obtained a great knowledge of Nagash's elixir, and in fact was beginning to win over his court. In an act of desperation, he had her assassinated through a virulent poison of Sphinx Venom, an almost supernatural poison that would have killed a normal human in seconds, but not one somewhat touched with immortality. Though after the discovery of her weakened and dying form, it was not thought that Neferata would live very long. Arkin was freed from his imprisonment and with the aid of Neferata's handmaid, made a desperate attempt to save the queen's life as his bond with her was something he did not wish to see disappear from this cruel world. After many days and nights of ceremony, Arkin attempted to bring the queen back from the brink of death, but ultimately it looked as if it would fail. And one last gamble before she took her last breath, he opened his wrist and let her drink long and deep from his veins, bidding his power to revitalize her soul. In one last look of acknowledgement, Nefrata gazed into Arkin's eyes and whispered his name before violently spasming in the seizure. He listened as the only woman he had ever loved's hearts took its last beat and set out to kill the one responsible. Now, to hear more on the story, I do recommend watching my Arkin the Black lore video. But what he missed after he left was that through some accident of the Sphinx Venom and the immortal elixir of Arkin's blood, Neferata was given true immortality, though not that of life, but that of an unlife, essentially an elixir of undeath, and thus the first true vampire was born in High Queen Neferata. Now that we have covered how the vampires came to be, it's about time that I classify what a vampire is and how they differ from these immortals born from Nagash, and what exactly the great Ma necromancer would come to be, mainly a lich. First, as I have covered earlier, the immortals were capable of supernatural feats of strength, speed, and regeneration. The same can be said of vampires, and they do also share many of the same weaknesses, primarily that being they are sensitive to sunlight, enough that it saps their energy, and if left in sunlight, it can actually destroy them. There are many explanations for this in the lore, one being that the god Petra of the Nekkar and Pantheon is actively trying to cleanse these abominations from his realm. Another is that Nagash himself gave them this weakness after their desertion from his undead armies. And finally, there is also the idea that the magical energies that bring life to these essential corpses is weakened by the wind associated with light and purity, which is also strong in direct sunlight. Now, as far as the god theory, I find it rather dubious as it is seen later that some vampires can actually walk in the sunlight and little harm and even little discomfort is befallen upon them. 
This also decredits the Nagash theory, as I am basing more of this lore out of the novels, as in my opinion, it makes more sense that he didn't curse them in some way, as the army book theories are rather weak in why they kind of give this answer. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense why Nagash would want such a flawed warrior after the fact, after he laid this curse upon them, when he easily could have corrected it. So, in general, I don't agree with many of the ideas about vampires in the army books, but that could just be my own personal preference. The last theory, and the one I give the most clout to, is the weakness to the sun has more to do with the winds of magic than anything. This makes the most sense to me, as vampires in general have an affinity for magic. They are magical beings. It only makes sense that over time and with practice, they could find a way to manipulate either the winds keeping them alive or that of the wind responsible of forcing them to flee the sun to allow themselves a brief respite while the sun is out. And I am starting to ramble, so let's get back on to topic for a second. Back on weaknesses. Now, both the immortals and the vampires have their lives ended by being beheaded or having their bodies burned and turned into ash. Now, this actually has to do with how magic in the Warhammer world is channeled through a vessel, whether that be a living or unliving creature. It is brought into reality through the mind and anchored to reality with the body. This is a rather complicated um, process, but all you need to know is that if either the entirety of the body is destroyed, or the brain, in this case, the head, is separated from the body, the link to the winds is severed, and the magic that keeps these undead beings alive dissipates. This is why when fighting vampires, either decapitation or burning the body is the only sure way to make this certain that the vampires will stay dead and not regenerate later. Now, another difference, and the most obvious, is that the Immortals were actually technically still alive. They had a heartbeat. It was a rather slow heartbeat, but a heartbeat nonetheless. Whereas vampires are most certainly dead. Though it is said that their heart also does beat, it's just extremely slow. Um, so as to keep their unnatural blood kind of circulating to all of their limbs. Now, there is no definite um, time for a vampiric heartbeat, but I am assuming something like once every few hours or maybe even once a day, depending on maybe if they drank recently. There's a lot of factors to be had, but the immortals never actually died to become immortals. That's the main difference I'm trying to uh, drive home here. Then there is the final difference between the immortals and the vampires. The Immortals, in order to keep their gifts, would have to perform an elaborate ritual and drain the sacred blood into an elixir they could drink, whereas the Vampires don't have to do anything, except simply drink directly from their prey. In fact, this is actually more significant than you think, as not only do they have to perform, don't have to perform any ritual, but something about their undead forms and their link to the wind of death allows even the most savage of their kind to absorb the vitality of their prey through their blood. But the blood must be fresh. A vampire in the Warhammer world, unlike many other universes, has to drink fresh blood. And when the blood begins to coagulate or in essence die, the vitality they feed off is lost so it cannot nourish them. Which means that the vampires of the Warhammer world cannot stock up on blood as they will need a living container to drink from to keep themselves alive. Also, unlike the immortals, the vampires can feed on anything. They are not restricted to humans, as animals and other various races have been drained by vampires to empower themselves. I feel like we should try to circle back and try to really delve into what a vampire is. Now, a vampire in the Warhammer world is a man or woman that feeds off the living to satiate the thirst for blood that is innate to their own life. They are apex predators of humankind and think of the living as little more than cattle and deserving of the same respect human gives to their own livestock. They are in fact no longer human in many ways. Now, before we go into the psychology of a vampire, it is important to note that I could not find a single instance of a vampire that was not a human in Warhammer. 
I am not sure if this is because no other race is capable of being turned, or perhaps it is the fact that the first vampire was a human, and therefore only human successors have been chosen to further the bloodline. Now, vampires are definitely dead. They have officially died through a ritual known as the blood kiss have been brought back into unlife in a parody of what they once were. Now we will get into the blood kiss later as it is a rather important and the only way the vampires propagate their race and I do certainly see them as a separate race as much as I see chaos warriors and grail knights as something else that's not quite human but sort of resembles humanity. Um, once a human is brought back into unlife as a vampire, they do actually retain their sense of self and their memories. However, it is almost as if their soul, the very thing that makes them human, has left for the afterlife, damned to wander until their body is finally destroyed or purified of this curse. Because of this, it is very common for vampires to be the complete opposite of what they were in life or embrace an aspect of their personality that gravitates towards evil and maliciousness. They are dark creatures, essentially, as they completely embrace the wind of death and the wind of dark magic. A good example of this would be of the witch hunter John Skellen during the Vampire Wars, who spent most of his life hunting the man well, the vampire, responsible for murdering his wife, only to become the monster himself, and kill and slay indiscriminately with no remorse, as the only thing that kept him from becoming a psychopath, his humanity, was stripped from him upon his death. His first death. There are plenty of examples, and ultimately it does paint vampirism as somewhat of a curse, in the sense that it strips the values of those who are turned and embraces the more dark aspects of one's personality. Now, this does not always happen, and there are a few cases of vampires regaining some sliver of their humanity, but this is definitely the exception. It is not the rule. And the longer a vampire lives, the stronger they become. And by association, typically the less human they become, taking on a more bestial aspect, depending upon the bloodline they stem from. Now, we have not talked about the various bloodlines yet, and I will be doing individual videos for each bloodline, so I won't be covering them in detail in this particular lore video. But one universal characteristic of all vampires is arrogance and pride. Arrogance in that they have a superiority complex that would rival probably that of the Skaven thinking themselves special and always attempting to attain more power and dominance in the mortal realm, and pride in that they believe themselves better than even other vampires, and not only that of other bloodlines, but even their sires and brothers and sisters. Now, before we transition into the structure of vampiric society, I do want to touch on the fact that vampires are undead, and therefore they are actually animated by magical means. However, unlike most spells, that effect of this curse is permanent as long as the vampire feeds and is not required to be recast at intervals by some necromancer or some sorcerer. They are magical beings tethered to the winds of death, and because of this they have some weaknesses other than what I have already discussed. Now, there are a ton of superstitions, more than likely started by vampires themselves thousands of years ago, amongst the land of men but there are inklings of truth in all superstitions. First is that vampires cannot cross the ocean or moving water. This is technically true, but like many of their weaknesses, it can be circumvented. When crossing water or sailing the seas, as there is an entire faction of zombie pirates I look forward to covering, if the vampire carries grave dirt with them from their native land or specifically where they were sired, they will feel little discomfort and have no issues on a boat. Now, swimming, however, is a different story. Now, it is not exactly specified in the lore, but I'm assuming if they need dirt just to be weakened when crossing moving water, then swimming is probably out of the question. But that is 
my own opinion. It doesn't mean that's fact. Now, their next weakness is that they have a reaction, a allergic reaction almost, to silver. In the Warhammer world, silver has properties that can either strengthen or drain magical energy, depending on its use. For a vampire, the very touch of silver will burn their flesh. And in fact, the wounds suffered at the hands of silver weapons are known to not heal, despite the impressive regenerative qualities that they possess. So, for instance, if they are shot in the leg with a silver-tipped crossbow bolt, the wound would never completely heal the way it should, forcing the vampire to more than likely limp, possibly for the rest of their own life. Maybe someday they can find a way to rejuvenate it, but it will be a long while before that wound finally closes up. Finally, as vampires are beings of magic, they can be repelled by magical wards, similar to those used to contain chaos and keep out demons, meaning that they can't enter areas strengthened with dwarven runes to keep out the dead or demons, or even in certain holy sites of various deities of the Warhammer world. Now, they can actually enter, it's seen throughout the Vampire Wars, they can enter a Sigmarite church, but unless you're a very strong or they've figured out a way to deal with it, the uh, pressure that is placed upon their bodies is actually um, similar to motion sickness. It's a weakening being able to feel like they can't move. And so it's an uncomfortable thing being in the presence of holy objects or sacred land. Now, likewise, they can be possessed or more precisely forced to submit to the will of another via magical means. The willpower of even a lesser vampire is said to be a match for the strongest amongst the living. But another vampire, and especially a necromancer in possession of certain magical objects created by the great necromancer Nagash himself, will allow the wielder to control the undead, which includes vampires. The Eye of Kemri comes to mind, as well as the von Karstein Ring, at least when it was tethered to Nagash himself. And of course, the crown of the great necromancer himself, the one that Azhag got a hold of before his doom, and the one that Sigmar even wore briefly, and it has passed down for many generations through various hero heroes and unlikely villains. But it is important to note that the Great Necromancer himself can call to the vampires as undead, and he can tempt them into submission. And if they get close enough to him, he can force them into submission himself without the aid of any gadgets or any magical items. He is just that much of a master of the wind of death. Now, necromancy is a very important aspect of vampiric society. In fact, so much so that I will be doing its own separate video explaining it. So we are going to move past that now to the structure of vampire society in general. Now, the structure does change depending on the bloodline, but as a rule of thumb, vampire society is a pyramid. The oldest and therefore the strongest are at the top. These are the heads of the bloodlines that still exist. They are ancient beyond the realm of modern men of the Empire, and even that of some of the Dwarven realms. Though not so much the Elves. They live probably just as long as Elves, if they aren't cut down. <laughs> it has been found out that each time the blood kiss is given to another, that a bit of the progenitor is passed down into the new Vampire. The older Vampire is known as the Sire, the new offspring is known as a get. Every sequential get sired will be weaker than its creator, meaning that eventually vampires, if they sire more vampires often and indiscriminately, that the bloodline will be so diluted that they will be barely any more powerful than an average human. For this reason, many bloodlines carefully handpick their gets and cultivate specific humans with certain traits to themselves that sh to strengthen and reinvigorate their bloodline. This is not the case with all vampires, but definitely with most. As for how these vampires are made, the ritual known as the blood kiss 
Now it is said that the army books that this is a secret and mystical process that varies from vampire to vampire. But the common connection, at least from the novels, is that the Blood Kiss is granted much in the same way as the first of their kind. The prospect human is ceremonially drained of the, their own blood until they are almost dead. And then the sire will slip their own wrist and allow their spawn to drink from them and consume their power. And ultimately their curse, which in turn we will kill them and burn out all of their humanity. Then after an indiscriminate time ranging from minutes to a day, the new vampire will rise once again and feed to satiate its new needs. Uh, another reason to pick your gets wisely is that often in vampiric culture, the sins of the son are often taken out upon the father, meaning if a vampire is seen as weak or brings shame to his bloodline, then the cruel justice of the vampires will be brought upon the sire, which can be rather creative for creatures that are so hardy and can in fact be tortured for all eternity or driven into madness. Now, an aspect I haven't covered yet of vampires is their thirst. You see, after a vampire rises, they have an instinctual need to feed upon the living. It is said that the first feed is extremely important, and for that reason it is wise to feed from a human, as those who have been known to have fed upon animals are unstable and too in touch with their inner beast that awakens in their unlife. This need to feed is a compulsion and it replaces the desire for food and water and really all other mortal needs. The curse is that this need can never be completely satiated or at least not by most or under certain circumstances. Now I do not believe that the blood itself is the important aspect but it has more to do with draining the life essence from their prey. The reason I think this is that the Necroc bloodline, blessed with a very potent gift for sorcery, can actually sustain themselves upon dark magic for extended periods with only slight side effects. It is also seen that the consumption of warp stone has a similar effect upon vampires as it does the Skaven Grey Seers, and in fact can sustain the vampires as much as drawing certain winds of magic into themselves. There is also the Blood Dragon bloodline, whose founder is said to have drained a full-grown dragon completely dry and therefore absorbed its life essence, and now he does not ever have to feed upon the living again. A trait that many vampires envy as the need for blood is a nagging itch that they all must scratch and which makes them dependent upon the mortal cattle of the world. Now, I have mentioned a few times the inner beast that is awakened in new vampires. This is both literally and figuratively. Upon their resurrection, each vampire experiences new cravings and almost a natural beastly cunning for hunting new prey. This is seen as the thirst, but also the animalistic transformation that most bloodlines are capable of performing to heighten their senses and make themselves more of a formidable threat. For instance, those of the Varn Karstein bloodline are capable of changing their forms with practice into that of a huge dire wolf for both hunting and fighting. This is an embodiment of their inner beast, and every bloodline has a unique form they can undertake with time and experience. Um, one's strength as well as speed tends to increase dramatically as well as throws the vampires more human aspects to the wind. This can be an intoxicating change as there are some vampires that prefer to embrace their more beastly side either through circumstances or by choice. These are what ultimately become the Vargulfs and Vargeists of the world. But that is also a topic for another day, as often this is also in tandem with a vampire that either refuses to feed or is being punished by not being allowed to feed. See, not drinking blood will not kill a vampire, but it will severely weaken them until they lose their grip on reality and truly go insane. Now once they are completely lost, 
their bodies will revert into the beast within them. And often they cannot ever be returned to their former state. Also, it should be noted that most vampires do not have a reflection or cast a shadow. It could just be certain bloodlines or part of the vampiric curse. But often in a new vampire, it can be disquieting and can lead to madness, especially in the more vain of their kind. This is why often there will be portraits of vampires hung in their castles, as they will never be able to see themselves with their own two eyes again outside of some artist's rendering. Another aspect of vampire society is actually how they interact with human society. Despite their superiority, all vampires have to interact with humans at a minimum in order to feed. But some bloodlines have seen the advantages in living amongst the humans, and in fact most vampires choose to live amongst their prey. Of course, how the vampire interacts with humans varies from bloodline to bloodline, but for the most part vampires take the cautious approach, either by living alongside the humans and feeding without actually killing their prey, or only feeding on humans that won't be missed or maybe even engorging themselves in a town to simply move on to the next before the humans can be roused to action. And after the Vampire Wars, vampires, despite all of their bravado, are a very sparsely populated race, as the humans do not take kindly to being treated as cattle. But one aspect of vampires I forgot to mention earlier is that their innate willpower and what they are capable of doing with this when subjecting it upon another being. As they are magical in nature, a vampire can more or less force a weak-willed human into doing whatever they please, almost like a kind of hypnosis, a trance if you like. Of course this is usually temporary, but most vampires exploit this gift to draw their prey into a more secluded location in order to feed. This also acts as a kind of natural lure for humans to seek out the vampire, and most vampires are well versed in seduction and temptation. Probably none are as good as the Lamian bloodline, but they all have a natural tension about them that humans seem to just find fascinating. This same lure is also how vampires from various bloodlines have come into possession of willing thralls and cattle that they actually want to feed from. Apparently the act of feeding on a human from a vampire can be extremely erotic and pleasing to the senses. Enough so that many mortals, after having it done and not be completely drained, actually crave the vampires to feed from them. Of course, there are also those humans who want to become vampires themselves, and therefore, if they do their master's bidding, hope to be rewarded with the blood kiss and join the ranks of the undead. There is even an entire group of people that willingly shelter and feed vampires in the empire known as the Stragani. Now, I will give you two guesses who they descend from. <laughs> Needless to say, they are not very popular with their fellow man. And that about wraps it up for this lore introduction, I'll call it, into Vampires of the Warhammer Fantasy World. I will of course be expanding more into this topic, including the official vampire counts and their army roster, as well as the legendary lords and even the art of necromancy in the future. I would like to say thank you to all of my loyal subscribers for sticking with me this long, and of course I would like to extend a warm welcome to any new viewers. If you so choose, I would greatly appreciate it if you would like this video and subscribe to the channel, as it really does help me get this content out there and hopefully enlightens anyone that wants to know a little more about the Warhammer universe. Now of course you will be joining the infamous Cult of Thick. Sorry guys, I am not completely sold on being thick boys, as have been left in the comment section, but that's about all I got on that subject. If I have missed anything or there is something vampire related that you want me to cover, make sure to leave it down in the comment section and I will do my best to make sure it makes it into the channel in some form. Now, as always guys, I have been Jumbo Thick. I hope you've learned something today and thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Have a good day.